Now let's welcome in, uh, let me put these back on, because this is the longest intro of a formal title that I will ever have done on this show. So here we go. This is R. Craig Miller, Chief Financial and Administrative Officer, Vice President, School of Professional Studies and University Transfer from Blue Ridge Community and Technical College. Craig, good morning to you. Good morning. Thank and, you. And that's Doctor. Is it Doctor? It's a Doctor, but Craig is fine. Okay, very good. <laughs> And Paige Moore, Dean, School of Professional Studies and University Transfer. Paige, your title's much shorter. Thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> and good morning to you. Thanks for coming in. Good morning. Thank you for having us. All right. Is it doctor? It is, but Paige is fine. A couple of doctors. <laughs> <laughs> Got this elbow thing I want to ask you guys about. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, Bill uh, turned me on to this. He said they're doing some incredible research over at uh, Blue Ridge. And I want to get into that uh, with you guys in just a second. But first... Carrying over the theme from the last hour, we had Seth Stefano on talking about higher education funding at universities around the state. He talked about the crisis that WVU is facing there. What is the situation at Blue Ridge? Craig, you know, at Blue Ridge, uh, we're very stable. Unfortunately, this past year, we because of the changes in the PEIA and the uh, additional expenses to the employees and to the institution, we have had to raise tuition. That is the first time we've raised tuition in five years. Was it by um, much? It was $9, I do believe. I believe so, very yeah. Nine dollars a credit. So we went from $172 a credit hour to $181 a credit hour. Um, we've been at the $172 a credit hour for uh, five years now. And, you know, we prefer to keep it at that level, but these changes in PEIA did force uh, a little bit of review of the tuition fee to make sure that we were stable long term um, and we, we are stable long term at this point as well mm -hmm. enrollment is also a positive trend we're seeing enrollment pick back up some positive trends in the fall we're seeing some great things in, in the summer and expect more within the upcoming fall as well so uh, at this time everything's stable if, yeah. if things remain on this trend are you continuing to be stable or are you anticipating some issues no i anticipate the the long term is a positive outlook for blue ridge you know we're, we're fortunate and that there's some things with and universities deal with that community colleges do not deal with so for one we don't have dorms so when you see uh, universities lose enrollment they often lose the enrollment head count and they also lose the the um the dorm as well sure so we we don't have a lot of those expenses and you if you look at blue ridge if you recall blue ridge we developed out of uh, shepherd university we were the community and technical college of shepherd and in 2005 we, we separated um based upon what the legislature required and we've been very focused on you know skills we've been focused on the type of trainings that we provide and uh, we're a lean institution and as you describe a very long title that's uh, Blue Ridge. Many people are wearing different hats and in different roles, and, and, and because of that, we don't have as high as expenses. Very good. Paige? Yes, sir. Did you have anything to add to that? No, sir. I like how she <laughs> continues to call me sir. I would like that same respect from the two of you in this room. Forget it, Rob. Especially you, Doyle. <laughs> You've been ornery this morning. He hasn't been invited for a long time, so he's getting it back. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, getting so, it out of my system. Come on. <laughs> so let, let's uh, let's talk about uh, this uh, research that you guys yeah. are doing at Blue Ridge because Bill kind of told me a little bit about it, but I'd like to get the full story from you guys. So who wants to go first and take the sure. lead on this? You want me to start off? Yeah, okay, yeah, sure. So if if you reflect back two years in 2021 and what was taking place in higher education and this forced transition that students were experiencing for online learning. As researchers, you know, we realized that this was a different times for students and we wanted to get at student perceptions and hear from them and hear what are your experiences of interacting with your peers? What are your experiences of interacting with the faculty members and how is that relating to your sense of belonging at the institution? When I say institution, we refer to them as institutions of higher education. I should say college. So how do your experiences at the college create this sense of belonging and this connectivity, mm -hmm. your ability to feel like you belong, that your voice is heard, that uh, what happens in the classroom um, relates to your sense of belonging at the institution. It's about student morale, 
about student well-being. So that's at the heart of what our study has been and collecting data for the past two years as we're continuing as well of making sure that we're intentional with our activities and making sure that students feel like they belong. And you have a, a college within the Eastern Panhandle here that, that cares about these things. Craig, if I could interrupt very quickly, your timeline's two years, that incorporated the part of COVID coming out of COVID That's and true. a little bit after we're out of COVID. Do you differ differentiate between that section within COVID and that section coming out of COVID? I think we describe in our research that this time that we're studying is coming out of COVID. It was still a transition of forced online learning um, where there were not many options for, for live classes as well. So their main predominant modality for learning was on the online component. As we're collecting today and the data we have, it's a little bit different. Um, as we continue the study, we will probably be differentiating between not only time, but also between the strategies that we're putting in place and how they are having a, an impact on students' sense of belonging. And are we seeing differences between those times as well, as well as between these initiatives that we're employing? One other quick question. Uh, do we have any comparable studies uh, prior to COVID that you can compare to and bounce off of? You want to go? Not your study necessarily, but in the literature. Mm -hmm. so yes, yeah, so previous to uh, COVID, there were several uh, CO, I'm sorry, community of inquiry type uh, research in higher ed, specifically in four-year schools and in uh, special schools like doctorate programs and things like that. There were some in K-12 as well, but there weren't a ton at the community college level, which was kind of the gap we were also interested in filling as well. Yeah. And they also were very limited on the effects of COVID and the transition to this kind of what we were calling forced transition. Before, the these studies would have looked at student choice of online and yes. not in this entire in time where they're being there are no options. It was online at this point in time. Mm -hmm. So, from a couple perspectives, your study is truly unique. It has not been done before, and I assume folks are now building upon it, and there'll be some follow-on studies by you and others. Is that correct? That's what we found yeah. in our initial creation of the study, and we are you know, trying to work with other individuals to replicate the study at different levels, whether that's at the university or at the K-12. You know, we found a lot of the principles within the community of inquiry is all about teaching and learning, so good teaching and learning is good teaching and learning regardless if it's andragogy and the adult learner or if it's pedagogy and the K through 12 as well. So we're hoping for some replication studies in addition to the studies that we're continuing. Now you used a couple of terms there that I'm not familiar with. <laughs> Sorry. Would you explain them? The so uh, um, andragogy okay, yeah. more is the study and just looking at the adult learner and how they learn and what strategies work for the adult learner and then pedagogy. Pedagogy is essentially the same thing but for the, the child. Learner. Fine, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you just use different words for the same thing depending on how old I someone is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But but we, now we, we do that for everybody though. John. <laughs> yeah. So what was the 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 basic purpose was to see how the student was adjusting and how they were relating to their peers and their teachers. Yes. Uh, I'm sure you'll develop on that, but you also looked at it from the teacher perspective mm -hmm. as well, did you not? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's actually what we're doing currently, so we don't have a whole lot of results on that yet. But yeah. this past uh, spring semester, we started gathering research on faculty perspectives of the exact same perspectives. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to know how they perceived students' sense of belonging in the course and how they perceived their ability to apply these principles of the community of inquiry mm -hmm. and um, their use of technology tool to create collaboration in the classroom. So we haven't had a chance to dive in too much, but the little bit we've, we've dived into it, it's been very interesting to see this gap between faculty perspectives and student perspective. And that's something we want to dive in a little bit deeper and provide training so we can help yeah. close that gap. Uh, develop that a little bit. Uh, what was the student's perspective mm -hmm. and then how did that compare with the faculty perspective? Yeah, so the little bit that we've been able to gather and, and look at so far is use of tools specifically. And um, we asked the students to tell us what tools were beneficial to them and enhanced the course. And a lot of they noted that all the tools that 
teachers use Enhance the Course. We asked the same question to faculty, and they rated those tools a lot lower. So for example, um, audio feedback is a very simple example. They, the faculty rated that pretty low, but students valued that tool. And so um, same with breakout rooms and some other tools as well. So that's an area that we want to focus our attention. And actually, we're working on some training to provide our faculty in August on using those tools and how to use them in an effective way that we can um, benefit students. So it sounds like even though you're using a, a, a different approach, a more modern approach, the faculty was still holding on to the traditional views that their uh, in-person class was far and away the most most effective and the students did not necessarily view it that way is that correct uh, yeah. i think that the, the big thing there was we were asking faculty how did they perceive students perceptions so the, the question was uh, for a student how does this specific strategy or, or as we're defining here a tool whether that's audio feedback, that's video instruction. We ask the students, how does that enhance the course? But then we ask faculty from their perceptions, how do you feel students value this as well? So it wasn't the question of do faculty value it, but what do they think but do you, value do it? Do you think it's possible that at least in some cases, the faculty member uh, was, do, was engaging in a bit of transference here? I think this particular tool is effective. Therefore, I think the student thinks it's effective. Is it possible some of that was going on? It is possible, and that's why I want to dive in deeper. I'd love to have conversations with faculty to know what they were thinking when they were taking that survey. How okay. many people were involved in the surveys in the study? 427 students in our publication and our original presentations, and we're closer to 600 at this point in time from the students and on the faculty side that's about 25 so far are you happy with those numbers yes we're yes. Very happy with the numbers i would now, like to do more with faculty but like i said we're just at the beginning stage mm -hmm. of that but with the students that number is statistically meaningful you have yes. enough yes, to be yeah. mm -hmm. john is a person who served on education committees for years i'm, I'm fascinated o only by four you. years only four years i did say four years Oh, <laughs> you said four years. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Could be. I, I, I'm sorry. I apparently misinterpreted. I apologize to you, sir. I think you're still angry for not coming in. <laughs> I'm just to, to jump me on that. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm interested yeah. in your opinion on this because uh, COVID was as disruptional to the educational process as, any, as anything we've had since maybe World War II. And uh, as a person who's really gotten intricate uh, with the details of how the state conducts its education of its students i'd like to hear your thoughts on the the, the idea of the survey and uh, maybe the beneficial parts of the results well th the survey is great i do think you need to go further and i think both of our guests think we need to go further on it but i think you're going down exactly the right route uh in terms of the disruption yeah we didn't handle covid correctly at the beginning it's really nobody's fault because we were well we got into an area that it, it was a total unknown we were kind of feeling our way around we did a few things right we did quite a number of things wrong we didn't know they were wrong until after they were done and we discovered they were wrong so yeah and 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 uh, uh we have uh probably about th three or four years worth of students that are still recovering we have to still get them back to where they ought to be in terms of learning because they missed out on a whole bunch uh and and yeah I, i'm wondering if if this is affecting the results you're getting uh if you were to continue this study say for another three or four years and then you you deal with some faculty and students that have been in a a more normal type of classroom setting like it was before covid whether some of the results you get might be different yeah that's interesting to see where our results will go i mean I, I think you're correct we really can't i don't think it's a overstatement to say that covid kind of was this uh this push towards 
fast moving online learning at that point in time mm -hmm. uh, at blue ridge we've been teaching online for 20 plus years since i've been there but um the intentionality of what we're offering now and a lot of the efforts and the technologies we're putting into the course mm -hmm. we have learned from the past three years as you've mentioned mm -hmm. of what works and what works better and what students say work better as well and what faculty are telling us mm -hmm. are working better yeah. also so that'd be interesting because you know the fact that you're becoming more skilled with delivering online classes the students are coming more skilled with yes. the technology and the tools as well so we, we would expect to see this um, change in time as okay. well yeah. i think COVID also taught us that education needs to be more flexible and we need to be teaching our students to be independent thinkers and problem solvers oh yeah and oh flexible. yeah and i think that has just created the shift in education it was we were headed that way but i think COVID just exasperated it out yeah. of the, out of, i'm sorry but out of the blue each of you what is your view of phonics? I don't know nothing about I, phonics. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I think phonics is really important because it's a basic skill that you're teaching students. Okay. It's the foundation. Yeah. I'm, I'm 60, and everybody in my age group had phonics in their yeah. first couple of years in school. It was the yeah. deal. Your study was directed toward, in your case, uh, Blue Ridge, mm -hmm. uh, Blue Ridge facility. Uh, how much of this applies to K through 12? Are you in a position to judge that? Well, I mean, we didn't dive too much into our framework, but the yeah. framework we use is called the Community of Inquiry. I'm not going to go into detail with it, but really it boils down to intentional practices of creating an active learning environment and allowing your students to engage with the content through exploration and through um, application and be able to engage with the faculty but also students through collaboration and critical discourse and quite frankly those are just really good practices that have stood the test of time and they can be applied at any level it doesn't mm -hmm. matter if you're teaching kindergarten or adults they can just or what modality you're teaching they're just really good practices so would it be fair to say or safe to say if you d replicated your study with K through 12 you would get broad uh, agreement in uh, in the results that's a good question I, i'm not sure i can make yeah. uh, like whether that association would be the same yeah. it would be one we would want to to yeah. study yeah i defer a little bit to Paige here because she has the unique experience of um, teaching in the berkeley county public school system mm -hmm. as well as at our community college mm -hmm. so she has those experiences where, where did you teach Paige in what grade uh, i was a math teacher in middle school and high school in berkeley county schools okay thank you yes sir Again, the sir. I like that. That's yeah. very good. <laughs> okay. Doyle, you still haven't picked up on that, by the way. I'm noticing. <laughs> okay. But, but the, uh, uh, but, Craig kind of referred to you. Uh, yeah, so it's hard to say because our study was online with college level, yeah, but I, yeah. I definitely think there would be some similar results at the K-12 level. You hope to continue this study, mm -hmm. and we've laid out today several different avenues. Uh, one to get more involved with the teachers get in a more in-depth perspective of the teachers uh second one is going through k, k through 12. uh if you do additional study where are you going to focus i think we're focusing right now on the faculty on the and faculty on okay. the faculty yeah. and we really we, we know a lot about what students have told us yeah. about their perceptions we want to see the faculty and we want to look at those gaps that exist i think for us at blue ridge we can then look at those gaps that have meaningful um, progress yeah. as well at the institution mm -hmm. I, I should have mentioned this up front uh, their study has been peer-reviewed that and it's been published in a peer review uh, scholarly ma uh, magazine uh, so that means it is received a thorough vetting by their academic peers which is a real credit to them so. the, uh, the the study and we we think of a, a, a survey of uh, college students as traditional 18 to 22 year old college students but Blue Ridge has a lot of non-traditional college students there are they included in the survey and do they uh, kind of get their own study column if they are yes yeah, absolutely so you know, at Blue Ridge we, we do have a diverse population we have a large um, high school programming they were not part of the survey we wanted to make this anonymous and so there it was 18 years and above but then it was all other students and you know we have a strong workforce development program adult programming the traditional age student as well we didn't look at it on any type of demographics we didn't look at it from age or from um, gender or any other because we wanted to make this as uh, anonymous to the student that they felt they could give us their uh, honest opinion with it so you know we didn't look at those age differences i suspect there very there could be some 
differences because of how people perceive the use of technology in itself. So we were very general with our look at the population. Do you have a, a, a shot at what the percentage might be of the non-traditional college student who is included in the survey? You have a pretty good idea of our population. Well, of the population, but maybe not within the survey itself. With the degree-seeking um, population, our average age is around 26 years old. Um, many of our courses were of the, the gen ed courses, mm -hmm. um, some of them within the programmatic courses as well. I think it'd be a good blend, but I really honestly couldn't tell you um, what the age average was. On the same uh, topic, uh, has the college had to make adjustments because of that two-year mess with education we experienced due to COVID for incoming freshmen in terms of catching up to what a let's say like a college level English course would be as opposed to a high school level English course, which we know the differences are, it can be vast uh, and how much time and, and, and attention these kids lost. Yes, so we've had, we have um, remediation courses for English and math. So before COVID, we started this co-curricular approach of when students come in, they enroll in their English 101, but at the same time, they enroll in a support type class. And so they take those together in the same semester with the same instructor so they can work towards the w achieving the credit for 101, but have guiding, guidance along the way. So we had that in place before we went out um, with COVID. It, but then since then we've just been able to increase the support that we can provide one way we've done that is by embedding tutors in those courses and so the tutor works with the student to improve skills specifically when it comes to reading skills so being able to break down uh, directions to assignments and break down the readings that they're supposed to do so they can comprehend what they're reading as well any final questions for Paige and Craig you two fine gentlemen. Yeah, I, um, uh, I'm, I was, I'm impressed with your study. I'm impressed the fact that you are, are taking the lead on looking at the perceptions between the faculty and the students. I'd be very, very curious to see what the se your secondary and tertiary studies show because I think you're, yes, you're doing something that's, uh, that's very much needed this point in time. Thank you. Any final bits of information we didn't cover you want to make sure you got out today? No, I think we're good. You know, it, it, our study, when you look at it from the, the bare bones, it's all about sense of belonging. It's all about making sure we create environments where people feel they're connected. They feel like their voice is heard. They feel like they matter. It's important to know that you have a college that's not only training your students and uh, yourself for skills, but also training you to make sure that you can be a contributor within the community and within your social group as well. So that's the, the basis of our study. Well said. Thank Thanks to both of you for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your time this morning at 9 o'clock. This is Talk Radio WNR Martinsburg.